Family of Liars, written by E. Lockhart, read by Brittany George. Chapter 65. Workers come and rip apart the deck. They stack the rough, worn boards in a pile on the sand and eventually cart them away. They rebuild in the same shape, a little wider, with bright new wood. They do repairs here and there on the walkways, fences, and steps. They fill the island with sounds of their tools. It takes four days. My mother and Luda clean Pensby from top to bottom. They ship all of Tompkins and Yardley's things to their mother's address and Uncle Dean's things to his place. Harris says only one thing to me about Dean's departure. He and I are no longer seeing eye to eye. Privately, Tipper says that the rupture was unavoidable and your father is completely in the right. Gerard has been upset over Fief's death. He is a sensitive person, and the second drowning in two years has made him want a job on the mainland. He takes his, he takes his leave of us kindly and will not be back. I haven't seen Rosemary. I cannot bear that I hurt her. I left her alone when she most wanted me. Abandoning her was probably undone everything I did all summer to try and make her feel loved and secure. I don't know how to mend it. I am both afraid to see her and longing to. The night after the dock is finished, Mr. and Miss Larry Feverman come to the island. Tipper offered to pack up Fief's things to ship them home, but the search for the body is ongoing. Fief's parents want to come out and talk to the police. My mother felt like she should host them. Harris picks up the Fiefermans at the woods hole, and the rest of our family waits for them on the new dock. We introduce ourselves and say how sorry we are. Mr. Fieferman is fat and in a wide, squared way, as if his body has grown into a shape of a boxy business suit. He has his son's thick hair and wears wired rim glasses. His wife is Italian-born. She speaks with an accent and wears a slim-fitting black summer dress and heels. Her hair is in monochromatic brown that comes from dye. Bess's lips quiver when she says hello. Penny looks at her feet. I look at the Fiefermans in the eye and think, he was hurting my sister. Then I course correct. He was drunk in the early morning. He swam too far out from the boat. We were looking and we went under and we searched and searched. Tipper puts the Fiefermans in Pensby. Goose is still a mess after the hurricane of the boys. Bess, Penny, and I agree that we never be alone with Fief's parents. If we speak to them as little as possible, it is Luda's night off, so we offer to help Tipper with supper. She is making many quiches for nibbles, something she only does for the best company in Boston. Bess is a much better cook than Penny or I, rolls and cuts out the quiche crust and lifts each into the baking tin. There will be lamb chops, potatoes, and a lettuce and mint salad, a blackberry slump of a slough with cream for dessert. The supper is quiet. Harris talks about publishing company. Tipper and Mrs. Fieferman discuss cooking and cardiovascular exercises. And Tipper says, what a pleasure it was getting to know Fief. He was such a polite boy. After we eat, and once Bess and Penny have executed them, excused themselves to watch TV in the den, Fief's mother takes a photo album from her bag. It is large and covered in faded fabric printed with storks, like she got it when at her baby shower. I stand to leave the room. I don't want to be near the Fiefermans any longer than I have to or see p pictures of the little boy who grew up to think a girl's body belonged to him just because he said please. But as Mr. Fieferman goes out on the porch to smoke, Tipper grabs my father's hand. Harris, stay and see the pictures. They lost their boy. She turns to Mrs. Fieferman. We lost our little girl too, she says. Last year, we lost our rosemary in the same ocean. I cannot move. We lost our little girl? Not since the funeral has anyone said that. Not since the funeral has my mother shown me that she feels the loss. Even when I brought it up, she only said Rosemary's not here. We all wish she were. Then she went on to talk about not dwelling on hard things and living a joyful life. But here she is, bringing up the subject. Did you? said Mrs. Fieferman, her hand on her throat. Oh, Tipper, I'm so sorry. No, no, it was a long time ago, Fief. I mean... Lor, he was here. He was just here. You've had a terrible shock. I didn't mean to talk about myself. My father puts his hand on Tipper's shoulders. I'm not sure if he means to console her or quiet her. It's the worst thing in the world to lose a child, says Mrs. Fieferman. They are meant to outlive us. She was so little, says my mother, choked. She loved to swim. We let her swim and no one was watching her. I don't think I'll ever forgive myself. We miss her every day, says Harris. That never goes away. You miss her? 
I blurt, I do. I stare at his face, as familiar and weathered as always, but now etched with grief, he almost never shows. I can't believe Laura is gone, says Mrs. Fieferman. A tear sliding down her cheek. I keep expecting him to walk the door, look, like he was the fattest baby who ever lived. I know I should leave, but the emotion in the room pulls me like a whirlpool. I stand behind my mother and watch as Mrs. Fieferman turns the pages through her album, pictures of baby lore, becoming kid lore, and becoming Fief, the boy I knew, drinking milk from a bottle, hugging a stuffed animal, sitting proudly on a tricycle, reading a book of fairy tales, eating a donut. My mother cries, low key and continuously, while she bends over Mrs. Fieferman's book and makes thoughtful remarks. Oh, he looks happy. I can see how much he loved you. My goodness, he was handsome. He got so tall. He had a good sense of humor, didn't he? She asks questions. Where were you in all where were you all in this one? This must be seventh or eighth grade, am I right? Mrs. Fieferman cries less but seems hungry for every photograph to be a witness and appreciated. You're very kind, she says to my mother. My father sits next to us with his face in his hands. Mr. Fieferman remains on the porch. The last picture is Fief grinning in his high school graduation gown, laughing at a part at a party with one arm around George's neck. He had to run away, Mrs. Fieferman says softly. Pardon? asked Tipper. He left home and didn't tell us where he went, Mrs. Fieferman explains. We, my husband and I, are divorcing. Oh, I didn't know. How could you? But it was, it's been a hard year at home, and Lore was, well, a boy gets angry when his world shatters, you see. My husband, he wouldn't let me have the house, and I refused to move out. She twists the napkin in her lap, still speaking low. Lore didn't want to spend the summer at home with us in so much conflict, but his father got him a job in the law office, very official, answering phones and the like while different secretaries look, took their vacations. We felt it would be good for him to learn some responsibility before college. And then one night, we had, I shouldn't tell you this, but we had a big argument, my husband and I. The next morning, Laura was gone. He didn't even leave a note. Oh no. He didn't call me for a whole week, and when he did, he said that he was at George's girlfriend's summer's house, and he wasn't coming home. He said he was staying forever and didn't give a phone number or anything. He was so unhappy with us, he just, he ran away, she said. We hadn't heard from him since that one call. I'm sure he would have come home to you, says my mother. He was just having a break, that's all, finding himself. A good boy like that wouldn't really run away. Mrs. Fieferman wipes her eyes. She puts the book back in her satchel. You girls are very lucky, she says to me. You have a wonderful mom. I smile. I know I do. Don't make her sad, you hear me, Mrs. Fieferman says. You be sweet to her, always. When she's old and her hair is gray, you be good to her then, as well as now. When you go to college, always call and write. Okay. Harris stands slowly, as if waking from a dream. Look at the time, says Mrs. Fieferman. I'm sorry I took up so much of your evening. Oh, it was lovely to see the pictures, says Tipper. I'm so sorry for your loss. Let me help you wash up. Tipper laughs and puts her hand on her chest in mock horror. I would never let you, she says, after all you've been through. Her voice is suddenly bright and hostessy. Go on, the two of you, head up to Pinsby. The coffee maker is loaded and there are some breakfast things in the fridge, but you come and see me around seven and I'll have muffins out of the oven by then, juice and all that, or come later if you need to sleep in. The police promise to visit before noon. The Fiefermans depart. Tipper gives herself a shake and heads to the kitchen. I'll do it, I tell her, following. Let me do it. You go to bed. She pauses. Is, is this because she told you to be sweet to me? Maybe. Tipper has never left any of us to clean the kitchen without her, but she hugs me and nods. I am missing our rosemary, she tells me, her voice choked. God, I miss her. Me too. So much. So much. Every day, she says, my little girl, each morning I listen for the sound of her footsteps and realize she's never coming down the stairs again. And I walk by her room when I am heading up to bed, and I poke my head in to check and remember she won't be there. You know, one night I thought I saw Rosemary. When we first got to the island this summer, she came into my bedroom. She looked like she had crawled up from the sea, just crawled out of it, as if to tell me I hadn't kept her safe. I couldn't bear looking at her tiny face with the wet hair around it. I was looking at, at my worst mistake, my most tragic failing, and I felt so desperately sad and helpless that I ran away. It was just a dream or my imagination, of course, but I told myself I wouldn't let my mind play tricks on me like that. 
I mustn't think of Rosemary and how I failed her or I'd fall apart. Sometimes I feel like I can't live without her, my mother says, like how on the earth I keep my existence when my baby is dead. How can I? Tears are coming down her face again, but I have to, Carrie. I have to go on. People depend on me. There's always another pie to bake or someone needs something, right? It's better that way. Your dad needs me. You girls need me. The dryer's on the fritz or something else is broken. People need to eat supper every day of the week, rain or shine. It's better to be busy, to be useful. That's how I get by. I don't know what to say. I don't know if it's better to be... I don't know if it's better to be busy and never talk of things. I'm sorry. Tipper wipes the corner of her eyes. It just gets me sometimes. I do think perhaps I should lie down. I'll be better in the morning, I promise. 100%. Back to normal. She smiles at me. Impulsively, I hug her again. I am taller than she is. She seems frail in my arms. She is brave and in denial, limited and powerless. Generous always, my mother. Come on, Tipper, says Harris, coming to stand in the kitchen doorway. I'll take you up. It's fine. I'm fine, she says. Tipper. I don't need help, Harris. I'm just a little headachy, it's all. It's been a real week. Neither of us is fine, says my father. Let's go upstairs. Thanks for reading with me today. If you liked this video, make sure to like and subscribe.